Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Wesley Emblidge. Uh, I am the Marketing and Education Manager at the Coolidge Corner Theater. Uh, thank you for joining us for another one of these Thursday night virtual seminars. Uh, we've been doing these every single week uh, since early April now, uh, several months. Uh, next week will actually be the first week that we're taking off, but we don't worry, we'll be back um, on July 16th. I'll, at the end of this, I will let you know about what some of the upcoming programs are, um, but we don't need to get to that because we have a great program tonight uh, all about JAWS, very timely, uh, well-timed film uh, for us to talk about. Uh, we have two great speakers. Uh, before I get to them, I want to quickly go over how tonight will work um, on just a technical level, uh, for those of you who haven't attended one of these before. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, you're going to see three different options. You're going to see the chat, the Q&A, and the uh, raise hand functionalities. So some of you already submitted questions for us ahead of time, and we'll be going through those. Uh, but if you want to ask a question or make a comment or something of that sort during the lecture, uh, there's two ways to do that. Um, if you want to just type in a question, the Q&A functionality is really easy, and that sends it right to us. Um, if you want to actually ask your question you know, in person, you can raise your hand, and we can actually bring you in on video uh, to give us your reaction, respond to something that was being talked about, ask a question, so on and so forth. Um, the chat functionality is also there. We're not going to be monitoring that as closely, so that you can throw comments and whatnot in there, but we're not necessarily going to be pulling questions as rigorously from there. So if you have a question, definitely the Q&A functionality. It's called the Q&A functionality for a reason. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'm going to get John. So uh, John, welcome. Uh, also Thank Dave, you. welcome. Thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you for hosting this. Uh, you guys are know so much about this movie. Uh, I think there's a challenge tonight of like, will anyone stump you? Um, oh, it'll happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, here's here's a pretty straightforward first question. Um, so it's from uh, Neam. I probably butchered that name. I'm sorry. Um, Neam asks, "I'm a 12 year old girl, and I've watched Jaws several times with parent." I keep wondering, for how long were they filming at sea? Yeah, it's a good question. So the Jaws production uh, basically arrived in Martha's Vineyard late April, early May. And I think their hope was to be on the island for just a couple of months, try to get as much done as they could before the, the tourist season opened and everybody flooded the island. Of course, we know that didn't happen. They were there through September. Um, but they were filming on the sea for a lot of that, about 20 weeks. Um, and one of the interesting things about Jaws is that some of those you know, out to sea shots were actually in different places on the vineyard and not as far out to sea as you might think. So they shot in a place called Katama Bay. They also shot a few close-up scenes of Robert Shaw and the Orca um, in a place called Shark City in Oak Bluffs, which is a little body of water, very much not out to sea. So classic tricks of the camera as far as that goes, but they were out to sea for quite a while and were out there much longer than they thought they were gonna be, about 20 weeks. Yeah, and some of the locations that they used um, for a while, they shot off East Beach of Chappaquiddick, so just east of the island. And uh, they spent a long time uh, basically getting beat up by the ocean out there. Uh, and when they figured out that that was just unnecessarily rough on them and everybody was getting seasick, they decided to move into Cow Bay, which was more of the northern shore near State Beach, uh, which was um, basically facing Cape Cod. So that gave them a little bit of a respite from having to be on the open sea. Uh, where the elements were really, you know, beating them up. And now they had a bit more calmer water. And then, as John mentioned, they finally went to Katama Bay, where they shot low, most of the end sequences, where uh, Brody is a, a, atop the uh, Orca 2, so that they really could have calmer waters to uh, stage those scenes that were much more difficult to film. Yeah, I mean, the, the ocean scenes, it's interesting. I think Jaws lore, you know, most people think about the shark not working and that being the big challenge, but there were a lot of challenges, you know, filming out to sea. I mean, they were contesting with the tide. They were contesting with the, you know, the, the, the horizon, making sure that it, it stayed consistent and that the continuity was correct. Um, you know, the, the movement of the shark and just making sure that it aligned with the movement of the boat and the, and the water and the wind. And, you know, there were a lot of things that they were up against filming out, out, out to sea. So it makes sense that they would want to kind of bring it into a bay or more of a kind of controlled environment where they could shoot some of that stuff for Act 3. Um, we have a couple different questions from Lewis uh, that I think are positioned at Dave, since Dave, you are, were an extra in the film. Um, so I'll group, I'll group, there's a couple of these. I'll group the first two together. Uh, Lewis asks, what were Roy Scheider, Richard Dreyfuss, and Robert Shaw like on set? And then also, what was it like working with Steven Spielberg? 
Um, so I've done a fair amount of interviewing of some of the original crew and got some of the real stories from them. And uh, one of the things that uh, Chris Crawford, who was the pilot of the Orca, so he was out on the water with them, the actors, uh, almost for the entire shoot. Um, he described the interactions between uh, Robert Shaw, Richard Dreyfus, and Roy Scheider. Uh, the, I think everybody hears that the, uh, the interaction between Robert Shaw and Dreyfus was contentious and had uh, a bit of animosity. Um, the truth, really, Chris thought that that was really just sort of a big brother, kid brother kind of dressing down. Um, and he was trying to elicit certain performances out of Richard, uh, who was not theater trained. Richard was basically more of a, of a, of a film person that he considered. And, and Shaw did have a little bit of disdain and contempt for the fact that Richard was not really, um, you know, as learned uh, about the, the, the art of acting as far as Shaw did. But Shaw was a very experienced actor. Um, but... Um, the uh, Roy Scheider was actually one of the more challenging actors to deal with in that he was really uh, he had just come off of the French Connection and uh, to work on this picture, which he was initially excited about, was an extremely more difficult challenge uh, in terms of the conditions in which they were on. Uh, the ocean was rough. Uh, they weren't getting their food often enough or it was cold when it finally got out to the boats that they were on. Um, and, uh, and Roy had an actual uh, temper tantrum one day that Steven Spielberg had to go and calm him down and they had to wrap production early until Roy decided to stay on the picture. So there are some moments that things just kind of got a little bit out of hand for Roy. Uh, as far as Spielberg goes, interestingly enough, as much pressure as there was, he really kind of shouldered it by himself. He didn't vent, um, he chewed his fingernails off, that's the lore, um, and he, wore, he kept a celery in his pillowcase at night because the scent calmed him down because he thought he was gonna get fired probably for four fifths of that whole production. Uh, and so there was a lot of uh, worry on his part. But most people said he, he was very competent, he was very calm, he never showed any signs of cracking, and yet le years later he confessed to sitting on the Orca on the back lot of Hollywood and would go there and just shake for years to work through the trauma of what went, he went through on Jaws. So he really had a poker face uh, for most of the production here on the vineyard. Well, to that point too, Dave, I mean, you know, not only was he dealing with the issues of the filmmaking, but he was also toward the end there, you know, dealing with a, a you know, a, a cast and a crew who were not, not so much turning against him, but had really kind of grown fatigued and tired of the production. And I mean, some of the special effects people had nicknamed it flaws. And I mean, you know, to have to shoulder that and try to get the film done while you're also sort of being victimized in a way, you know, you're sort of taking the brunt of all of the, the mishaps they've been dealing with all summer. You know, that's, that says a lot, you know, for him that he was able to right. just sort of weather it and finish the film. Just, just for a moment for our viewers, I just want to show we're actually on Amity here. There's the ferry pulling into the Vineyard Haven, Haven Dock. Um, so I'm here just outside the Black Dog uh, doing uh, the show here. So uh, Are you supposed to be on that ferry, Dave? Are you supposed to get on that ferry? <laughs> There's a 945. I think I can catch the last one. <laughs> um, so Lewis's uh, two other questions were, um, did you ever see Bruce up close? Uh, and then also... Do you keep in touch with the people you starred alongside or any of the other personnel? You kind of answered the latter a little bit, but. Sure. Um, yeah, Bruce was definitely a fixture on the locations. Um, I happened to see him in Shark City once. Um, uh, and um, he was, you know, Shark City was in the tucked away in the corner of the harbor in Oak Bluffs where they stored and worked on the sharks. Um, and, uh, and he was at the beach scene. I was in the Alex Kintner scene um, where Lee Fierro was. Uh, Lee Fierro was my drama teacher at Oak Bluffs Elementary uh, when I was in kindergarten. So um, uh, I didn't really, when I moved off the island, I didn't really keep touch with her. Um, but since, um, since then, there's a lot of people like Rennie Ben David and others, local uh, kids that I knew, extras, who I'm still in touch with this, to these days. I'm, you know, I'm, I come to the vineyard regularly still. Uh, every summer. So um, there are some people I keep in touch with. Um, and there's a lot of people who have remained here uh, that um, uh, were worked on the film or were in the film as extras. And, uh, you know, it's a special place. Anybody's into Martha's Vineyard, they know that. So, but yeah, there's still a lot of the original uh, people who are extras and, and crew members uh, who are still on the island. Um, so we have a, a question from John here about a, a very specific anecdote that we'll, we'll see if you guys know the answer to. Um, John asks, is it true that Gregory Peck owns the rights to the Moby Dick movie and created a situation where the scene had to be cut that showed the film? True? Any additional info? So I'm assuming there was originally a scene where they watched Moby Dick in Jaws? John, John, have you heard that one? Yeah, I think th there was a scene, I believe, um, where Quint is in a movie theater 
and he's watching yeah. he's watching Moby Dick mm. and he's laughing and the way that Spielberg has described it is you know he, he's sort of laughing at how fake the whale looks and I guess his laugh I think the way they described it could be heard down the halls and out into the street and that wasn't so cool with uh with Peck so they they didn't they didn't put it in the film but I think that was originally slated to to make the make hmm. the cut yeah yeah I would have loved to have seen that. <laughs> um, an anonymous attendee asks, do you think the movie would have been so popular without the amazing soundtrack? No. I don't yeah, think. I agree. Just to, yeah, I don't even need to think about that. But my opinion. Um, I mean, you, yeah, you've, you, there have been stories about how they saw early cuts before John Williams' score was in, inserted into the film and they just didn't, you know, the, the, the score stood in when they didn't have the shark, very much in the same way that the barrels, you know, stood in for the shark when it wasn't working and they couldn't. Um, so the music, you know, it's almost cliche to say, but the music really is a character in the film. It's, it's integral. And, um, you know, it, it's Joe Alves said at one point that, um, you know, the shark, the mechanical shark, when they had it out to sea and they were working with it, it was so loud that you could, you could, you knew it was coming before you saw it because you could just hear all the tubes in the air and the compressors mm -hmm. and, so he said it was amazing to later see it with the soundtrack. It was, it just became a completely different animal. So yeah, my opinion is no, I don't think it, it would have been as big of a film. And the music was really instrumental in kind of cueing you into when the shark was present, because if you watch the film, you'll notice that whenever the shark is present, his theme is going on. But when there's like the fake kids with the fin in Oak Bluffs Harbor, um, they're not, there's no music playing. And uh, there's a lot of scenes where you think you might be getting faked out and, uh, the, the, the lack of music is, the music cue was really the presence of the shark. So even when the barrels were there, uh, the music played, but there was, there, there's sections where it's just not, you're not hearing the music and so you think it might be there, but if you really pay attention, you realize the shark is never there when the music is not, when his theme is not being played. Right. So it, uh, it really, it cues you into knowing that. And if you watch the film with that, you'll be like, oh, I don't hear the music, so he's not here. We're just getting a little bit of a tease by these POV shots of the shark from under people's feet. Which kind of speaks to, the, you know, a brilliant composer to utilize silence. You know, you think about, well, what is the music doing? But what is, what is the, the absence of music doing? And to, to be cognizant of that as a composer, I think, just speaks to, you know, his talent and what he was able to bring to not just Jaws, but basically everything else he's worked on, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we have a raised hand from Naomi. Uh, so I'm going to bring her in. Uh, bear with us. The ferry has just docked. <laughs> um, Naomi, can you hear us? Hello. Naomi, you're on mute. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> uh, oh, I, I, I saw the film la uh, last year with, um, at Symphony Hall, and so oh, Keith wow. Lockhart was, yeah, conduct. So the sound was really amazing <laughs> to see it that way. I bet. That sounds fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> did you have a yeah, question did or did you just want to mention? Yeah, I just wanted to mention that. Cool. Oh, Thank cool. you. Yep. They actually did a screening on Martha's Vineyard last summer for a festival called Beach Road Weekend. And they did it with the Cape, uh, Cape Cod Symphony Orchestra. Uh, it was really wonderful to see it here on the island with a, a live performance. And of course, a lot of islanders and some people who were in the film came for the screening as well. I've often seen... Um, different places they've done outdoor screenings of Jaws like on the water. Oh like, yeah. And an inner tube and everything. And I've always wanted to try to go to one of them. I mean, it's kind of terrifying, but it, it's I kind agree. of part of the appeal, of course, right? I know. I'd like to do that too. I've never, I've never done that, but you got to get a yellow raft if you're going to do that. And, yeah. <laughs> um, so Frank asks, uh, Frank says, I've heard that Spielberg, like a lot of highly regarded directors, would put a lot of himself into his films, such as his childhood fear of clowns, and a tree outside his bedside window, uh, both of which he incorporated into Poltergeist. Has he ever, ever publicly commented on anything in Jaws, not just sharks, but maybe more threatening sides of nature in general or the price of human arrogance, personified by the character of the mayor? Hmm. John, what do you think? Interesting question. Has he spoken publicly about that? I don't know, to be honest. I, I can't think just off the top of my head if he has explicitly said that he's put something like that of his own story or his own you know his own experience into the film i don't do, do you can you think of anything dave 
No, I mean, a lot of Spielberg's influences later in films, particularly in E.T. and so forth, dealt with divorce because his mm -hmm. parents were divorced and that was a really scarring experience for him. So the family unit in Jaws is actually a very tight family. Right. Um, the Brodies love each other. There's that really endearing scene with his son basically imitating his facial expressions and the hands clasping. So um, I think, uh, you know, Spielberg's voice is on the radio and the orca when they're being called. Uh, his dog, uh, the, the Cocker Spaniel, is the Brody's dog. Um, but these are obviously superficial editions of, of Spielberg himself. I think Jaws, as his fledgling effort, was really trying to stay true to the material. And later he started to deal with some of these issues that were really plaguing him, particularly divorce and childhood that he was, mm. you know, so he, he really wanted to, you know, a lot of his films later, Empire of the Sun and so forth, Abandonment. Um, so a lot of these things did show up later, but I can't think of any really in influencing Jaws. Yeah, you might be right, Dave. I mean, it might have been just so early in his career, especially once once they got to the vineyard, he, he wasn't probably afforded the luxury of even, you know, it was just making the making their days and getting shots and just, you know, getting it made that he probably wasn't even in that headspace probably at that point. Yeah. Get, get the story told any way possible with what they had to work with and not really think about what your mind's eye is seeing to make the story perfect. It was, you know, it was an imperfect situation. So I think just getting the story in a, an entertaining way was what they were, their objective was at the time. Um, we have a raised hand from Suzanne. Uh, Suzanne, I'm going to promote you to a panelist. Suzanne. Hello, Suzanne. Suzanne. Hello. Don't be shy, Suzanne. Hmm. Her mute's off. Uh, yes, she is unmuted. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Okay. Uh, <laughs> She could just hang out with us. Feel free to try raising your hand again. Um, instead, I guess I will go to this question from Amanda. Um, Amanda asks, what are your favorite Jaws references slash motifs in other films or TV shows? Uh, Amanda in particular, she's thinking of the beach scene in Us uh, or Willem Dafoe's character in The Lighthouse. Hmm. Well, I mean, mine is, mine is from a film that might not be taken quite as seriously as those films, but I, I always sort of love the uh, Back to the Future 3 reference when the 3D shark comes out at Michael J. Fox and he looks at it and sort of scoffs and says, ah, oh, the shark still looks fake. Mm -hmm. I always thought, especially that, you know, with Spielberg being behind those films, that that was kind of a fun little uh, poke at himself and poke at the, at the shark. So that's maybe not my favorite, but certainly something that comes to mind. One of my favorites was um, uh, Richard Dreyfuss, I believe in the 80s, did a movie called Stakeout with um, Emilio Estevez. And there's a scene when they're in the stakeout and they're cops kind of waiting and, and they're trying to pass the time. And uh, Emilio Estevez says, guess, guess this movie line. This was not a boat accident. And, and Dreyfuss just goes, I don't know that one. <laughs> so it was it was it was obviously you know it was it was something they improvised or they decided let's just do this one because the audience will get it that knows jaws right um barbara asks where is bruce today no more he's gone <laughs> do we know what happened to him or well the, the 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 materials used to create the sharks was not really a survivable long-term material um, the only thing I will say, though, is that Greg Nicotero, who's a huge Jaws fan, he's the executive producer on The Walking Dead, the only surviving shark that was created from the mold of the original Bruce uh, was found in a junkyard in, uh, uh, I think, John, is it Tarzana, California? Or, or I think somewhere. so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or Sun City somewhere. And mm -hmm. they knew, they found it, uh, Joe Alves and Roy Arbogast, who worked on the original shark, they found this shark that called Junkyard Jaws. And so Greg, uh, Greg Nicotero actually last year restored that shark to look as good as he could. And it's going to sit now in the lobby of the uh, American uh, Arts uh, Academy, uh, basically the Academy Museum in Burbank, California. So um, there is a Bruce. It's not the Bruce. It's a Bruce that was, was created from the mold. And I believe this particular one was created for the theme park in Orlando, Florida, and then sold off and hung up in this junkyard. So mm -hmm. not a movie, not a screen used Bruce, but one that does have the DNA of the original. It's funny when you think about it, sort of putting my, my fan hat on for a second um, or collector hat, you know, you think about like, how could they get rid of it? You know, like how could, how could the orca boat be gone? How could they just let these things rot? You know, mm -hmm. and the thing that you always have to sort of remember, which I always, I have a hard time remembering is that 
you know, once these films wrap, you know, they're on to the next gig. And, and, you know, in hindsight, we can look back and say, what a classic film. And, you know, how could you get rid of something that's so, you know, ingrained in Hollywood um, history, but to them, it's just another gig. And these things just kind of rotted away and they had no sense of how big the film was going to be or that there would be any value in holding on to these things in perpetuity. So um, I think you find that more often than not, that it's just another gig. And especially with Jaws, I'm sure a lot of those folks were ready at the very end of wrapping that they didn't want to be reminded in any tangible way of what they had just gone through over four and a half months. So um, it's interesting when you think about like, how could these things be gone? But that's how it goes. Yeah, same thing happened to the Orca. The Orca was left to dry rot on the back of the Universal's lot. And there was never, I mean, this was a classic boat. I mean, to some people, it's as big as the car in Back to the Future or the Millennium Falcon or any of these things. And yet, was just neglected and finally destroyed. So um, it's 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 interesting. Uh, but 2020 is you know hindsight is um, you know of course we'd all love to see these things today. But uh, at the time maybe they just thought it's you know move on to the next job. My one anecdote related to this is um, I was fortunate enough. I guess I would say fortunate. Some people may throw tomatoes at me for saying this, but to see the the shark Bruce from Jaws: The Revenge, the fourth installment, back before that rotted away down in Orlando, Florida. Um, so while not certainly not the masterpiece of Jaws, uh, it was nice to be, uh, you know, to, to connect with a, a piece of the, the franchise in a way. Um, we have a raised hand from Lewis. So Lewis, I'm going to promote you to a panelist and hopefully it will work uh, better than last oh, time. Oh, Lewis is on video. Hello. Hello. Um, okay, Dave, uh, question. Did you ever have any like personal interactions with like any of the other actors on set? Like Roy um, well, Lee Fierro, yeah, Lee, Lee Fierro was um, was uh, the person that I was. Uh, I, I mean, I was five years old and I was very scared. It was a big, intimidating movie set. So I did interact with Lee, who played Mrs. Kintner, um, who has some speaking lines in it. Uh, pardon the sirens, um, but um, uh, I never had any cause. I mean, actually, I get asked one or one, once in a while if I interacted with Spielberg. And frankly, on a movie set like that, Spielberg interacts with the actual pr principal actors and the assistant director interacts with the extras. Um, he's really in charge of keeping that uh, going. And, and so the principal stuff is, uh, um, you know, uh, really the director's interaction to get the performances. Um, but, um, you know, Rennie, Ben David and others, um, I did see, you know, Richard Dreyfuss was there that day uh, at the beach. He wasn't in the scene, but he was definitely there. Um, and, uh, but I didn't really interact with them. Um, I do know uh, Jeffrey Voorhees, who played Alex Kintner, owns a, a place, uh, or he's a manager of the Wharf Pub here in Edgartown. And uh, I did, uh, I actually just got a t-shirt from him the other day. We were both on the beach that same time. He's older than me. He played, you know, I think he was 12 at the time I was five. Uh, so, um, but Jeffrey, you can come down here and uh, go to the Wharf Pub on Main Street in Edgartown and meet Alex Kintner and get a t-shirt and even eat a sandwich named after him. <laughs> oh, cool. Uh, thank you, Lewis. Uh, so I'm going to go to a question from, uh, from an anonymous attendee who asks, was there a first screening of the film in Martha's Vineyard with the cast and so on and so forth? There was, uh, Dave. I think you could tell that story probably better. Yeah, I, I was there for that. It wasn't a cast screening. Um, it was a, well, it was a cast and crew screening of Martha's Vineyard Locals. Uh, the premiere that uh, the stars went to was actually held uh, out in the West Coast. Um, but the, um, uh, the island screening was really, um, nobody knew what the film, if it was going to be any good. And a lot of people, uh, mused that it probably wouldn't be with all the problems that they were familiar with, but it was a little bit more of a like, Hey, I see you. I saw you. Everybody was kind of like, you know, looking for each other. And then they were actually scared, which was really impressive because everybody thought it was going to be, at least I did. I thought of it like Godzilla, a monster movie, not a terrifying thriller. And uh, it took the breath out of me. I was really little, obviously, at the time. But uh, I think a lot of people were quite surprised to see the film was far more effective uh, at scaring them than they anticipated because they all saw the shark and they knew it was fake looking to them in, in real life and so forth. And But the film was just so well crafted and edited and everything. It just was, it blew everybody away. The island was, was really impressed at how well they, they actually put this film together in the end. Yeah, because, the, you know, the, the producers, the Universal Studios producers were really, um, really cognizant of not wanting to, you know, show the shark, you know, and, and they kept it. I mean, they had like, I think they had armed guards outside the boathouse where they were building it. I mean, they, they were really serious about not leaking 
what it looked like because they feared that people wouldn't take it seriously. Mm -hmm. And there's a story where uh, Joe Alves was approached by a reporter who I think it was from the Christian Science Monitor had said, yeah. oh, well, I've spoken with um, I've spoken with your colleagues. It's fine. You can talk to me a little bit about the shark. And so Joe revealed some information and, and this person ended up going and sneaking into the boathouse where they were keeping and storing all the sharks, snapping a photo. And then it got published. And Joe has said that, you know, he thought he was going to lose his job over it. So the word got out what these sharks were and what they looked like. And I think that there was some concern that maybe people wouldn't find it scary. And also maybe among the Islanders who had seen the photos of the shark, well, this is, you know, that's fake. This isn't going to be that scary. So to Dave's point, the fact that they were scared by it is a testament to the film, you know. Um, Suzanne asks, what can you tell us about Quint's sidekick in the film? Was his, it was his name, was his name, real name, was his real name Stephen Potter? Uh, I've IMDb'd and Googled and tried to find him. Do you know anything about how he was cast? Was he local? I've been pretty obsessed with that character for decades. Uh, so spot on in his stature and quintessential silence and odd subservience. Well, I believe his name is Herschel West. We have a friend uh, who knows even more about the film than I do. So if, I, if I'm wrong, my phone will light up in any minute. Um, uh, I believe his name was Herschel West and he was a local. Um, you know, the reason that he sort of captured, you know, on screen that, that classic fisherman aesthetic, that sort of salty New England, you know, fisherman vibe was because that's what he was. Um, like a lot of folks that were hired, most folks, they were not professional actors. Um, Craig Kingsbury, who played Ben Gardner, the same sort of situation. These were local people that fit the look and the sound of what they were going for. And they gave these people, they gave these people parts in the film. And yeah, I think he works great with, with Robert Shaw, especially because he's, you know, he was much shorter and with the little dog. I mean, he was sort of the, a, a perfect sidekick character, but he was a local, a local guy. Um, I suspect he didn't act in anything else. Um, but that's about as much as I know about him. Dave, do you know anything more about? Well, he, he was a local fisherman. Um, he did. Uh, sorry, guys, I'm having to relocate because my battery is low. So my apologies for the <laughs> shaky camera move. Um, but the... Um, he was local. He was a, a Menemsha fisherman, uh, which is where Quinn Shack is. And he was cast, uh, Sherry Rhodes, the casting director, was really particular about finding people who are very authentic as fishermen. So, um, you know, he was a little understated. He wanted that for the, uh, the character, that Quint was the bigger personality. Um, and Herschel was here on the vineyard probably till he died. I think uh, 10 or 15 years ago. I don't recall exactly how long, but um, yeah, he was he was a long a long time Islander, um, and I think he worked in the, he had a much bigger role uh, initially. They cut his scenes and made him a he. I don't think he had any speaking parts by the time the film was basically edited. But um, they definitely you know they used somebody who was hit the role in a way that a local only a local could. Um, Trisha asks, was the first shark that was hung up killed for the film? The, I, I'm assuming she means the tiger shark. I would uh, think so, it, yeah. it, was, it was not killed for the film, um, but it was flown up here from Florida on ice huh. and, and used um, and smelled just as bad as you, you think it might from what the people that were a part of the film said. Um, but no, it was not killed specifically to be in Jaws, but um, it was a real shark. And um, yeah, it was flown up here from somewhere in Florida on a yeah, of ice. Yeah, Tiger Shark, and it started decomposing pretty quickly. So they had a lot of issues with the fact the shark was just sort of going bad. And the, the whole dock, even when they were shooting that scene, ended up really smelling quite a bit. Um, Abigail asks, has there ever been a discussion of remaking Jaws now that special effects are so amazing? And do you have any thoughts uh, on how it might be cast if it was remade today? Um, that comes up quite a bit in the Jaws community, and a lot of people insist that should never, ever happen. Um, uh, I'm, I, I, I'm open-minded about these things, but I think John can attest to the fact that remake is sort of a, a four-letter word in the community of Jaws because they feel that the film is perfect, and the shark works just the way it should because if it worked better, they would have had more shark in the film, and that would have made a worse movie, and even Spielberg says that himself. And I, I, think, I think Spielberg, there's some sort of unofficial clause, right? I, I don't think he wants any of his films to be remade, at least while he's living. 
So there's a reason why you haven't seen a new Back to the Future or a new fill in the blank Steven Spielberg film. Uh, he doesn't want to see it. And, you know, I'm, I'm like Dave, I'm open minded, but it's certainly not in my top 100 films I'd like to see get remade. I don't think it's necessary. In terms of casting it, gosh, I've never even thought about it because I usually put the thought of a remake out of my mind at the, at the onset. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a good question. I, I don't have to, I'd have to think about that. I don't, I don't really know. Maybe Paul Giamatti would make a great Hooper. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, if people have suggestions, feel free to throw them in the chat. Please, yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to go to a question from, um, so Greg says, I always thought Lee Fiero was too old to play Mrs. Kinter, but she's fantastic in the scene on the dock. Did they audition anyone else for the role, or did they always know that she was the one for the role? John, do you want to field this one? I, you might know better than I, Dave. I, I suspect, I don't know if they you know, auditioned. I know that she was shorter than they wanted. I mean, she was standing on an Apple box to be at the same eye level as Rich, at, as uh, Roy Scheider. Um, so maybe in terms of her build, she wasn't quite perfect, but I'm not sure. Maybe you know more about that than I do, Dave. Well, the, uh, her age was 45 for the movie. So she was 45. So technically she could have been um, Alex's mom. That wasn't really uh, implausible at the time. However, um, she was classically trained and was, uh, she actually ran the children's theater in the island. She was my drama teacher. Um, so in many ways, she was really the most qualified for the job as an island native, or as I, she's, she came here, she didn't live here, she moved here from New York City. But um, her abilities as an actress were just, floored them so much. Um, and they knew that that pivotal scene with Roy Scheider when she slaps him, is kind of the middle part of the movie that really motivates his character to get over his fear of the water and accept his responsibility um, and to not be pressured by the mayor and the town to just go along for the sake of commerce. So um, it's really, uh, you know, I, I think they may have auditioned other people, but they were really convinced that Lee was the right one for the role. Um, we have a raised hand from Charlotte. Uh, Charlotte, I'm gonna point you to a panelist. Hello, Charlotte, can you hear us? Charlotte, Charlotte's muted. muted. Uh, Sorry, that was hello. <laughs> oh, you didn't mean to raise your hand. OK, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, I will switch you back. Uh, in that case, let's go to this question from, <clears throat> um, from Doug. Doug says, I saw a clip of Dreyfus being really embarrassed about being in the movie prior to it being a big hit. Was this really a common sentiment that they were in a big turd? I think it was. John, I, mean, I think that that was, you know, I think that was a genuine, you know, um, the feeling amongst a lot of people. I mean, you have to understand that, you know, we see the finished product, but they were there day to day. They were there grinding it out when things were not working, um, when just about everything was falling apart, boats were sinking, motors weren't working, people were fighting. I mean, they, they saw probably the worst of it. And I think that there was definitely, and certainly they, they spent a lot of time seeing that shark out of the water and you see all of its guts and you see it not looking, you know, you don't want to get too close of a look at it or too long of a look at it, you know. So um, I think that's what they were going away with. And, and I think that that was probably a very genuine sentiment on, on, on Dreyfus's part that, you know, this was not going to be, um, this was not going to be a big film and, and ironic in his case in particular, because, you know, he came crawling back to the Jaws project after seeing a previous film of his and thinking he was terrible and that he better get a job while he could still get it. And so then to do Jaws and to sort of walk away, probably feeling defeated and as though this was not going to be a, a success, a successful film, I'm sure was, uh, I'm sure it was deflating for him, but thankfully, you know, proven wrong. But. Well, and, and what happened, Jaws was rushed into production because of a strike that was going to happen. And uh, they were told that the shark needed a good year, year and a half. Even like General Dynamics and other defense contractors were told to bid on it. And they all needed more time. Uh, and they really, in, in essence, had three, four months to develop the shark. So uh, Dreyfus was in an interview saying it's not Spielberg's fault. It is actually the fault of Universal Studios for rushing this picture into production. But bear in mind that Universal Studios was trying to respond to the book's best-selling status. And the book was right at the top of the list still. So they saw it as they were maximizing the, the marketing opportunity uh, of their project. And this was really the time to strike while the iron was hot. 
Um, so a lot of things forced the production to be rushed. And uh, none of these were Spielberg's fault. They were all the studio making the pressure to happen. So um, that's that's really, you know, I think it's, it, Dreyfus was right about, you know, it's not Steven's fault, but he didn't know what the editing room was uh, coming up with and the score and, and some of the pickup scenes they shot in L.A. And, and it was a constantly evolving picture right up until the final screening. Um, uh, and they, you know, like they added the head coming out of the bottom of the boat uh, in the editor's pool out in California. They shot that as an insert and because Spielberg wanted one more scare. So uh, there was just moments that they, you know, they worked up until the end to make that picture as tight and, and, and as, uh, as suspenseful as possible. And I think they did a great job, but maybe, you know, uh, Dreyfus didn't see all these things happening at the time. Um, we have a number of people asking about the sequels. Um, I'll specifically read this one question from an anonymous attendee. Please comment on the sequels to the original Jaws. Did they diminish the franchise? I personally didn't even realize they had been made. I think John, Dave you want to talk about some of your favorites? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Boy. Well, you know, I, I don't think they diminish from the original. I mean, it's sort of like, you know, when people say, some people say that, you know, when films are made of books, that it ruins the book. I mean, the, the book stands on its own. The original Jaws stands on its own. And I, I don't think that it's affected at all by the sequels. Um, you know, I, I'm a very sort of nostalgic person, especially when it comes to film. And, and I, I grew up seeing the sequels. Um, you know, I used to watch Jaws 3 on TBS all the time and, um, and Jaws 4 and, and, and the second film. Um, so I, I have a soft spot for the sequels. They're certainly not on the same plane as the original by far, but I think that there is there are redeeming qualities among all three of the sequels. Um, even though, yeah, Jaws is Jaws. But Dave, any thoughts on the sequels? Well, I'm I you know I believe um, Jaws two to me is really the next in line in terms of uh, film quality and 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 uh, something in terms of being a, a work that I can watch over and over. Um, I remember seeing the Jaws 3, Jaws 3D, the third dimension is terror, John reminded me as the tagline recently. Um, and uh, I hadn't seen Jaws uh, The Revenge until John and I watched it a couple of years ago because I just didn't have any interest in, and I had seen some clips for it and thought it was, it just didn't look worth the 90 minutes of my time to get into. Um, but um, I thought Jaws 2 was definitely, you know, it, 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 it carried on the story of Brody, of Chief Brody. And to me, that was an important story to tell because he had kind of, he came into his own by the end of Jaws, but I thought he had more fight in him and more evolution as a character to really uh, do so. Um, but I don't think that, you know, I, I think the sequels, whatever the quality of the sequels, Jaws remains on its own to be one of the best Hollywood movies ever made. Um, and I think one of Spielberg's best films ever made. Um, so I don't see in any way those films taking back uh, any of the quality that that film, uh, to me, uh, uh, contains. Um, I just, I want to, I've actually never seen any of the sequels, but I do know from Jaws the Revenge, just the famous quote from Michael Caine about it, um, <laughs> where he said, uh, I have never seen it, but by all accounts, it is terrible. However, I have seen the house that it built and it is terrific. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is just a yeah. I, I think you know, and and cut me off about the sequels because I could talk you guys all all night. But <laughs> there's enough connective tissue to the original in all three that I think is what's appealing to me. The reason I love Jaws three so much is because it was such a departure from one, two, and parts of four, which were shot on the vineyard. This was not shot on the vineyard. Um, you have the Brody characters, but other than that, it's really kind of a complete departure. And, you know, it was directed by Joe Alves. So that's, you've got the connective tissue to the original film there and the, and the second film. And the beginning of Jaws the Revenge was filmed on the vineyard. And I always thought that it was really neat to see Martha's Vineyard in the wintertime, you know, with the backdrop of a shark attack and all this, you know, the things that we know from the story. So there's enough in those sequels that I, I think, um, you know, hold my attention. But I, I also have a high tolerance for some of those other kinds of films. So take it with um, a grain of salt. Kelly asks, if people do go and watch these sequels, um, do you recommend watching them in chronological order or is a different order better? Definitely think, one and two. One and two should go together. I don't know, John, what you think about the next two, if that- I think three really stand, I think three really stands alone because there's no reference, there's one reference to the, to the shark attacks that they grew up with on the vineyard, but by and large- Oh, John, you froze there. Uh, Dave, is he frozen for you? Yeah, he's frozen for me. Hmm. Um, 
John will definitely say that, <laughs> I'm gonna speak for him briefly here. Uh, John will definitely say that Jaws 4 has more connective tissue than 3. Uh, Jaws 3 has just got Dennis Quaid playing uh, one of the Brody sons, right. but doesn't really have any other kind of connection to the stories of Jaws 1 and 2. They, so re they refer to the shark attacks on the, you know, from that summer in the first film. But aside from that, that's, there's, there's no other real um, connection. But there's some great right. death scenes in Jaws 3. I don't know. I, check it out. I forget who asked the question, but do it. Check it out. Um, okay, Tim asks, uh, and I'm gonna say, let's exclude the sequels from this. Uh, what is your favorite shark film besides Jaws? John, you wanna? Why don't you start with that, Dave? There's a lot in my brain. I, I need to parse through them. Um, hmm. I really enjoy Rennie Harlan's Deep Blue Sea. Um, I think that the character, first of all, there's a lot of nods to Jaws in Deep Blue Sea. Um, and uh, Rennie Harlan, who was a director who did Cliffhanger and uh, Cutthroat Island and other films, he was a big 90s director. Um, I thought he did a pretty good job of not creating a ripoff of Jaws, but creating something on its own. Um, and there's some really, especially this, sorry to give away any of these story points, but um, the film's been out for a while, but Samuel Jackson gives this incredibly rousing leadership speech and then quickly is devoured by a shark without any warning uh, when that happens. And these are just moments that I think made that film really memorable. And LL Cool J's in it. And, uh, <laughs> you know, the, there's just, it's a lot of fun. Uh, it's rewatchable to me. I really enjoy it. Um, and uh, uh, the only other one would be um, Open Water, um, which was an independent film shot by a couple on weekends. Uh, about, um, it was based on a story about um, a, a couple in Australia that got abandoned by their tour boat. They were on a scuba diving tour and they were just left behind and kind of bobbed up in the, down in the water, you know, uh, dozens of miles from the coast of Australia. And because it was a true story, it was really terrifying. And they were there day and night until finally, uh, you know, the sharks start coming and, and the end is near. So, um, but I always thought that film was really inventive. You know, it's not a big blockbuster film, but it certainly was um, effective as storytelling and as an independent film that was shot for, I think, $28,000 budget total. Uh, I thought it did a really admirable job. So I guess I have two answers to that. Um, and there's a lot of shark films that I enjoy, but the first one um, is a blatant ripoff of Jaws. And I think the reason I like it is because more so for the pop culture legacy that it has. It's called Great White. Uh, it was also called uh, The Last Shark. And this was a film in the early 80s that came out that was such a blatant ripoff of Jaws that Universal Studios took them to court. It, it made the theater, it hit the theaters in the States for a couple of weeks and then they sued and it got pulled. Um, that's great fun. They built an animatronic shark. Um, it's, it's, it's wild. Um, there's another little film that I like, a shark film called uh, The 12 Days of Terror, which was actually a made for TV movie uh, uh, based on a true story about the 1916 shark attacks that happened in Jersey. And that's actually a pretty well, well done film, especially for a made for TV movie. It was suspenseful. It's a period piece. It's set in 1916, obviously. Um, but it's, it's sort of a lesser known film. And it, I think it's worth tracking down if, if you're interested in something that's related to Jaws, but you know, based on a true story and a period film and um, some good scare moments in that. So I, I'd recommend it. The only other one I would add to the pile here is Orca, um, because Orca was uh, just two years after Jaws came out. And the idea about Orca was uh, the killer whale is the only natural predator of the great white shark. So there was a bit of a, um, a, a way to sort of say we are stronger than Bruce in Jaws, and we've got an animal that actually could kill a great white. Um, so, um, you know, I think on a filmmaking level, it wasn't quite the up to what Jaws did, but uh, it is entertaining. It, it, there's an all-star cast, really incredible cast, um, and uh, it's effective as a story, and it's, it's kind of like a real Captain Ahab type uh, right. adventure. So um, I definitely Great soundtrack. Up on yeah, and great soundtrack. And Neil Morricone, uh, yeah. Yep, and uh, produced by Dino De Laurenti. So um, yeah, really great filmmaking. Um, and uh, there's so many shark films out there that, it, you know, um, a lot of them don't really rise to the to the level I think that uh, most people would really call classics. But I'd put Orca probably uh, you know more closer to that circle of, of description. Um, Mary asks, "What was your approach to developing the interactive Jaws location guide?" This was something you guys discussed in the lecture a little bit. Um, how long did that process take? 
Well, we, uh, John, uh, Jim Beller and I, Jim Beller is a, 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 one of the biggest memorabilia collectors in the country who has a, a huge treasure trove of photography that nobody's ever seen uh, about the production. Um, uh, we all came together to work on that. The tool set for Google 3D uh, birth mapping is actually fairly well developed. So anybody can really, uh, and I suggest if you have uh, places on a map or anything, if you want to build a map that is sort of theme based or, or has something to do with a particular subject, um, go right in and uh, sign up with Google and, and do it for free. It's really great. We developed this for free. But um, John and uh, John was really instrumental in getting a lot of the sequels placed as well as some of the original films locations cited. And uh, I think there is quite a bit of, um, you know, we just want to make sure the details were correct get as much of the photography that we, you know, Jim wanted to include that people hadn't seen um, and to be as comprehensive as possible. I think the harder stuff to get was actually the Los Angeles based locations like the, the tank where they shot some of the underwater scenes, um, uh, Catalina Island, what bay were they using? Um, and even the, you know, finding the pool where the uh, Ben Gardner's head scene was shot. Um, some of that took a little bit more time to sort of identify where that was, um, but we have nearly, I think we're up to 80 different sites in that map. And the beauty about it is, is if we find more, we can add it. It's a live site. So there might be more that we add later on if we discover anything else. Yeah, and the, and the hope, you know, is once COVID is behind us and we can travel safely and people can go to the vineyard, they can use this as a tour guide and go see the locations for themselves. You know, that's, I think the ultimate goal. I came in on the project a little bit later um, it was really the brainchild of Dave and Jim. Um, so, yeah, hopefully people can get to the vineyard and see some of these places, because a lot of them are largely unchanged, which is cool. Um, well, on that note, uh, William asks, I know that the Islanders had problems when the production was filmed, but how do they feel about it now? Are there any Islanders that do like it when a fan comes to the island? It's interesting. John can probably talk a little bit about how this, this island didn't really embrace it for a long time. There was no Jaws memorabilia or objects of, that you couldn't buy t-shirts and so forth. Um, but now they're, uh, they're everywhere. Um, and I think that the island has re-embraced uh, the whole uh, notion that the film is popular and, and that many people are, um, you know, they, they, there's commerce to be built around it. Yeah, I sort of feel like back, you know, a couple of years ago they had a Jaws Fest and it was put on by the Martha's Vineyard Chamber of Commerce. And I think probably after that happened, they realized that there's there's money to be made. It, this is can be this is a commodity. It can be a marketable thing. And um, when I was a kid going to the vineyard, there were there were no there weren't I shouldn't say no, but there weren't a lot of signs that the the jaws was shot there. And over the years, they've started to in introduce more memorabilia, and you can buy a lot of things. And I think, like any tourist location, there's probably a love hate, where they're sort of maybe sometimes they're tired of the jaws people, but then the jaws people come and bring money to the island, and it's it's a, you know they inject cash into the community. So. Um, you know, I think probably a love hate, but I think more so love probably than hate. Um, so, uh, let's see, uh, this anonymous attendee asks, what do you think about the impact of the Jaws franchise had on the real endangered shark population and what actions have been taken to try and course correct? Um, well, I can speak a little bit about what I've learned from Wendy Benchley. Um, uh, Wendy Benchley uh, now runs a, a, a number of nonprofits uh, that basically uh, are all about the preservation and uh, ecological balance of, of living with sharks in the ocean. Um, I think that Peter Benchley was, you know, he wrote the book and he wrote the first screenplay and the objective was to create something successful. But after the success of the film, there was a bit of guilt about how it demonized sharks and that it wasn't really an accurate representation of what sharks are like. Sharks aren't vindictive and vengeful and come after somebody personally. Um, they're animals in their natural environment and we've been thrown into the mix with them as humans who now swim in the ocean. Um, so uh, a lot has been done actually to try and counter that. And particularly Wendy Benchley, uh, her husband passed away, I believe, in 2006, um, but they've been part of an effort to try and turn the tide back from that uh, and really make it so that, uh, you know, people understand these are not, these are animals to be respected and, uh, and to uh, not really think of them as, as evil. Yeah, I think you nailed it, Dave. I mean, that, that pretty much answered it. You know, I think, you know, there's people like Greg Skomel and others that are, you know, a part of that community that's bringing awareness to sharks and, um, 
I think Wendy Benchley and Peter Benchley, when he's alive, had a, you know, had a big part in, in sort of raising awareness. Um, Ron and Valerie Taylor down in Australia, you know, same thing. Um, so, yeah, I think you nailed it, though. Um, well, on this note, Naomi asks, are any of the shark facts that they talk about in the film fictional or wrong? It's a good question. It I is, believe, yeah. yeah, I think that, um, you know, there's, uh, you know, the, the, the notion that sharks attack in shallow water is definitely true. Um, you know, sharks have a kind of a, a they don't have a very high uh, vertical profile. So uh, sharks do attack in three or four feet of water. Um, they, um, they do have territories. Uh, the sharks all around Cape Cod and Martha's Vineyard are basically territorial based on the seal population. So they do hunt in particular areas where the feeding is good. good. Right. Um, I can't think of anything else that the film might have said that was um, contrary, uh, except that sharks don't chase boats and things that are right. really right. dramatic license types of story uh, driven elements. Um, so anything in which the shark seems to have a grudge against the characters in the film is, is very much not in line with reality. And, and perhaps the, some of the aggression in act three, you know, where Bruce is busting through the boat and got, maybe, you know, that's a little creative license. Um, and to Dave's point about being vengeful, I mean, we won't get into Jaws 4, but that's basically the premise of Jaws 4. So you can, <laughs> you can decide whether that's reasonable or not. But um, no, within the first film, I can't really think of too much that, that they fabricated or that might not be, you know, you think about the Kittner scene, that's completely plausible. Um, shallow water, you know, splashing around on a raft. I mean, you could see the confusion. I mean, it's happened in real life. So I, you know. Yeah, most of the reasons that, peop that sharks attack people is because they mistake them for seals. Right. Um, if they're on the surface of the water and they're silhouetted by the sun, particularly people wearing something dark like a wetsuit, a black wetsuit. Um, you know, sharks don't particularly like eating humans. They just happen to sometimes bite us because they think we're something else. And then they realize, ooh, that doesn't taste very good. And they, they so you don't see, a lot of times sharks don't fully, they don't eat uh, a person, but they do strike them in such a way that they cause arterial bleeding and they usually end up dying of blood loss. Um, so, um, but a shark doesn't really like people as, a, as an attraction uh, to eating. Uh, it's not their natural uh, food source. Hmm. Um. John asks, um, who did the costumes for Mary Lair Vaughn? His sports coat is now famous. I feel like we have to discuss the mayor a little bit in part because he's kind of been memed in recent years for, in comparison to a person I will not name. Yes, but uh, maybe even, maybe. <laughs> oh, oh, John okay. froze there. Here, let me step in in John's absence. Uh, yeah, Larry Vaughn's jacket, the anchor jacket, was actually found um, in a local thrift shop um, uh, on the island, or it was on the Cape, either way. Um, but it was not a, uh, a, a, a costume designer's uh, intentional uh, item. Uh, it, was, it was discovered, like a lot of things in Jaws were discovered. They found this thing and they're like, that's Vaughn's jacket, that's, that, we gotta put him in that. Um, you know, and uh, so um, there were some costumes designed and things, but again, the film really relied on so many, you know, fishermen, your cast, what do you wear when you fish? Bring that. You know, like wear right. what you wear. That's not, we don't need mm -hmm. to give you a costume. Uh, the only deliberate costume choices I think that they were talking about was making sure nobody wore red so that the boat and the blood the shark created uh, were the only mm. things that had red. And actually, mm. it's funny, Jeff Voorhees, who played Alex Pintner, wears red shorts. And he says, well, I think they didn't really mind it because that foreshadowed my death. You know, there was a, an element of that. Um, but other than that, that, that Spielberg didn't want any red to be seen in the film unless it was signifying death and blood. Mm -hmm. John, you got cut off earlier. What were, you gonna, what were you gonna say? Oh, nothing. I think Dave pretty much covered it. But, but to his point, you know, I think part of the reason that they landed in Martha's Vineyard to begin with was because that's the aesthetic they were looking for. So a lot of it was already set up for them. Um, I, I know that I, I believe there's been, you know, quests to find that Mayor Vaughn jacket that I think have gone unsuccessful. I, I'm not sure that anybody knows where it is, but hopefully, hopefully it turns up. One of these I, I believe there's actually like an Instagram account or a Facebook page just called Mayor Vaughn's jacket. You know, hmm. like that's, they, really? they want, you know, it's that it, it has its own personality. So, and the, the, on the post, it's like the jacket interacts with people. Like, I know I'm the coolest thing in Jaws. And, and so it's, it's a witty little page, but uh, again, yeah, everybody talks about that jacket. 
Um, so we're, we're actually at the end here. Um, and I have a question I want to end with that I think will give you both a chance to kind of like make your case for Jaws. <laughs> so uh, it's an anonymous question. So Dave just said the film is perfect. This crowd clearly comprises of total fan club members. I, a Bergman slash Fellini sort, just saw Jaws for the first time a year ago. Yep, it's good. But please enlighten me. What is all the fuss about? <laughs> John, you want to take the lead? Why don't you take the lead on that one, Dave? <laughs> you said it was perfect. I didn't. <laughs> um, I think that my observation of Jaws uh, as a perfect film are that, um, and again, having been here during the production and learning all the stories was, it was lightning in a bottle. Um, you know, uh, Bergman and other filmmakers, you know, who work in very controlled environments and say exactly what they, uh, they, they create a film that's very, very well designed. Um, and I think in, way, in some ways I give a little bit of slack to Jaws because it was so uh, hard to control. Um, and so many things were not predictable and not controllable. Uh, and it was a struggle to get the film the way it was. And so I think when they turned in as good a film as they did, uh, and it's so effective, um, and especially, you know, I think about the characters in Jaws a lot like the characters in Fargo, where you think of them as like, you know, the region, you know, the, the place that they are from is very, very evident. You know, their, their, uh, their regionality is something that comes across really well. And I don't think actors would have necessarily, you know, trained actors would have necessarily gotten that uh, quite as well. Um, you know, because I think it, it, it takes authenticity to do that. So, um, you know, uh, it, you know, I, I should say the film's not absolutely perfect. There are a couple of flaws that you see in the film and everybody talks about some dubbed lines and, and some inconsistencies. Uh, so, but I think as an entertainment, uh, you know, as far as carrying you in the story and delivering you to a climax that is ultimately really a big payoff, um, it, you just kind of get sucked into the story and you enjoy it. Uh, and, and uh, you know, it's kind of a popcorn film. It's not necessarily high art, but I think that there's a bit of, you know, uh, uh, there's, there's a bit of, you know, it's the American blockbuster. It was the first blockbuster. And uh, in many ways, I think it, it, it's one of the best blockbusters. Uh, and it was hard to duplicate that success, but Hollywood discovered it with Jaws and they tried to keep getting that success over and over. I think you nailed it, Dave. I mean, I was going to touch on the summer blockbuster thing as well. And, and also just to sort of distill it down to like a simple statement. I mean, it's a comeback film, you know, I mean, there was every step of the way that film should have, should have failed, you know, and aside from it, it, the fact that they were able to finish it and complete it and release it is amazing. The fact that they were able to finish it, release it, and it was such a success is sort of unbelievable if you know what went into it and, and just okay. how, how the, the odds were stacked against them. So, it was the first summer blockbuster. Like Dave said, it's not a perfect film. I mean, there's some really fun sort of Easter egg, you know, errors in the film. When you think about Teddy Grossman falling out of the boat in the estuary, he's not wearing shoes, but that severed leg has got a shoe on it. So if you can, an you can analyze it and pick it apart to death and find the places that it was not perfect. But I think, you know, it's, it's an important film um, in American film history. And I, I think it's, it's a comeback story, you know, that everything was stacked up against those filmmakers and, they produced the film and they produced the first summer blockbuster. And I think for that reason alone, I think it's, it, it's, it's given, it's, it's, it's worth its due, you know, it's, um, you know, so. I, and I think that the one thing to add that I would put on is it, it basically the second act, the, uh, the ensemble acting of Scheider, Shaw and Dreyfus, um, they really dialed in uh, a great sort of chemistry between all of them. Um, when I think of Jaws, and I think a lot of people do, they think more about the second half and the way those characters in the class warfare and the, the fear of the water that Brody had and, and a lot of these things, that kind of embodies um, the, uh, the, the real culmination of what the film is trying to show is that, you know, people of disparate, uh, you know, values and beliefs and capabilities coming together to defeat this one object uh, that's their aggressor. Um, and uh, I think they all did a marvelous job with the acting in that. And I thought it was, you know, that last act really came together in a way that, uh, you know, a lot of the rest of the picture sets up, you know, it's the second right. act for me that really is the, the, the payoff uh, where the film gets really tight and uh, extremely entertaining. Well, and they're relatable characters. I mean, if you didn't, if you didn't buy into those characters and if, you know, if you didn't feel that maybe you could relate to one of them and you didn't, or you didn't care about their story, then the scares don't matter. You know, then they're then they're out in peril and they're out in the ocean and they're getting attacked by a shark and you, you really wouldn't you wouldn't you wouldn't be invested you wouldn't care as much so, you know the film's got humor it's got scares it's got a little bit of everything and I think you know that's part of the mass appeal and 
why it's, you know, sustained all these years from a critic standpoint and a fan favorite as well. So. Um, well, thank you both so much. Uh, this has been great. I know there's a lot of questions we didn't get to, but we went through a ton in this hour. Um, this has been fantastic. Um, I want to quickly pitch people on some of the stuff we have coming up. Um, so next week, as I mentioned at the beginning, there is not a seminar. We're taking next week off for the first time in a while. Um, but we will be back later in July. Um, on July 16th, uh, Kira Sterling is going to lead a seminar about the Julie Dash film, Daughters of the Dust. Uh, this film actually did recently screen at the Coolidge uh, in February, uh, but is fantastic. Um, highly recommended. It's a great excuse to finally watch it if it's been on your list for a long time. Um, on Thursday, July 23rd, uh, we're going to be talking about Spike Lee's really underrated uh, 25th hour. Uh, and that's going to be led by Stephanie Zacharek, who is the head film critic for Time, who's fantastic. Um, we have a bunch more planned for the end of July and into August and even September, um, and we'll be putting some of those on sale pretty soon. Uh, I want to also mention tomorrow in our virtual screening room, uh, we're opening two films. Uh, we're opening the documentary about John Lewis, uh, the civil rights leader and uh, senator, I want to say, not congressman. Um, John Lewis, Good Trouble, highly recommended. Um, really getting a lot of acclaim and like a super, super relevant film to watch right now. Uh, we're also opening a really fun looking movie called Beats. Um, and we are, we are working toward reopening. Uh, we we, we're, we wanna make sure we do it very safely. We don't have a firm opening date or anything like that, but we are, we're looking at every option uh, and all the community support is super, super helpful. All of your donations, your memberships, uh, it makes all the difference to help us, especially as we move back into potentially reopening soon. Uh, it's gonna be a tricky process. And so we appreciate everyone bearing with us during the closure, supporting us with these seminars, with the virtual screenings, um, and hopefully, hopefully we can be back with you in person and virtually uh, sometime soon. Uh, so with that, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you again to Dave and John for leading this. And uh, thanks, guys. Thanks for having us. Great time.